Hello everyone, so today's video is going to be a bit different. It's not going to be scripted. It's going to be a more or less off-the-cuff review of a book by John Krakauer called Under the Banner of Heaven. So Under the Banner of Heaven is a true crime book that looks into violence committed by fundamentalists of the Mormon religion. It gets into the various violence that's happened in the last couple of years, especially centered on the polygamist offshoots and splinter factions of the Church of Latter-day Saints. It's by a gentleman named John Krakauer. And John Krakauer has a regular full-time job besides writing books, and that is he is a journalist who has worked with outside magazine. He himself is a very avid outdoorsman, mountain climber he hikes he fishes you name it. he's been to alaska he's been up everest i have a history with him before this book i read into thin air many years ago into thin air is about a disaster that happens on mount everest that the author so happened to be at he was writing an article about the companies that go up and down everest and he was actually sent with one of the companies, and he has summited Mount Everest. And it's his detail of exactly what happened and the various pressures of being just in that type of environment because everybody's oxygen deprived, so it's a disaster. They talk to everybody, they get different versions of events. He also wrote a book I read earlier this year, which is called Into the Wild, and it's the biography of Christopher McCandless. Christopher McCandless is this strange character who upon graduating from college decided to give all his money away and essentially live as a drifter. Inspired by the works of Thoreau and of, of London, Jack London, Call of the Wild, he decided he was going to go into Alaska without a map and without really efficient supplies and sort of just live off the wild and he died in bitter agony i'm actually going to do a book just about survival literature that mentions both of these now let's talk about my history with the book i give myself these challenges to do with literature and i bought this among with five books for a challenge i called non-stop no fic and it was a challenge to read as many nonfiction books in a week as I could. And I read three that week. I read The Professor and the Madman, Hillbilly Elegy, and Tuesdays with Mari. Tuesdays with Mari is also by a journalist, and it's a journalist who resides in Michigan. I was also did another challenge shortly thereafter, before I can't remember, called uh, Three Books in One Day. Try Hard, as you can see, is what it says. And about this time, I was talking to this about Jacob Mathis, who suggested some challenges and suggested some challenge names. And one of the challenges he suggested was read as many pages in a day as possible. And I had never kept a accurate catalog of exactly how many pages I have read in one day. Um, I do have, I do know of books I've read in one day, but I don't know their pages. And I read about 312 pages in one day of Under the Banner of Heaven. I completed it the next day. It has a total, not counting acknowledgments or whatever, of about 341 pages. Yeah, it shouldn't really shock people that the number is so low. I'm not a speed reader. Uh, this is my 32nd book I've read this year. And it sort of goes with the theme of, you know, get hard. Get stuff that takes you out of your comfort zone, be it nonfiction or fiction. I think far too many people in America are flailing out particularly guys you know like their first foray into science fiction will be something like a star wars book you know for lightsaber battles and they'll never go anywhere else with that so i actually wanted so i actually read this book with that spirit because this book is a hard look into polygamous cults in general and it spares no detail of the violence both, of course, you know, physical violence and the sexual violence committed within these polygamous cults by its followers. 
So let's discuss the good of this book. This author assumes that you have no knowledge of Mormonism whatsoever. And while mixing in the murders that happened in 1984, he discusses the general history of the church and its foundation within the United States of America. One thing that the author points out that makes Mormonism very interesting to study, just from the pure academic perspective alone, is the fact that this is a religion that was formed within the United States itself at a time where there was a lot, lot of reading and writing going on. And so there's a lot of documents, and we know the history of this church pretty well. And of course, the history of this church, as implied by both John Krakauer and several others, especially in the book The American Religion, is also to some degree a history of America. This book gives you a very good in-depth history lesson of the Mormon faith, but just in general of American history. You know, it's uh, very fascinating to me that at one point in time, polygamy was considered the greater evil over slavery. Uh, of course, both are bad, but it just was shocking to read, to read about that. And of course, I didn't know that legitimately there has been a lot of violence against Mormons within this country. Now, much of that goes back to their early tumultuous founding. But nevertheless, I did find it very interesting. So, one of the things that a lot of people don't know is Joseph Smith backed polygamy. That is, one man having multiple wives. And this created um, a schism, if you will, within the church when later on, church leaders, uh, the church leadership, the presidency or revelator as he's known in Mormonism, did away with it because it was like Article 132 of their sacred articles. And they said just no more. Well, you can't just get rid of and erase an article. So it's still actually on there within the teachings. And that has prompted a lot of what we call splinter factions within the faith that aren't just necessarily centered on polygamy, although they practice it. They also have other beliefs that are against the main actual Church of Latter-day Saints. Also, too, Mormonism has sort of a built-in mechanism to it that allows, that says God speaks directly to people, albeit in the mainstream Mormon church, only to the president, seer, and revelator. This has prompted other people to say, well, I hear the voice of God as well, and that's what's caused a lot of the splinter facting that happens in here. Now, one thing that I have to say is really great about this book is the passion with which John Krakauer writes it. He is very passionate about the abuse that is suffered by children, especially young girls in that church. Also, of course, grown women within that church. A lot of these polygamists so happens to be, well, should be obvious because they hold sort of old attitudes about women. Do you treat them and abuse them like cattle or any other type of animal? And here we're spared basically no detail. Some authors like to just say abusive relationship or child molestation. Not John Krakauer. John Krakauer devotes a lot of pages of this book, fairly meaty portion, to really just giving it to us. And it is disgusting. I feel that this should come with a warning, this book, not to eat like an hour before you read it and not to snack while you're reading it. I'm not kidding you. It can get that gross. However, I do not believe he does that out of gratuity. I think that in general, <clears throat> he does it as a form of activism. He wants us to really understand and really know that there are actual problems that are going on here. Hold on just a minute. Sorry about the silence there for just a second, but I gotta switch out my headphones. They go off every 10 minutes, so I gotta power them down and power them up. 
So he really wants us to know what the abuse that these people go through is. And he also tells us about some businesses that fund polygamy so you can vote with your wallet if you live in that sort of section of the High Plains region, I guess, as it was known. There's also a sort of sociology of religion that he gets to in depth. He describes himself as a man who drained his bank account after he found, after he got interested in Mormonism, and you can tell he has well read on it. Uh, being an autodidact, it wouldn't surprise me with his level of knowledge that he acquired of himself if he was still considered one of the ten most knowledgeable men when it came to Mormonism and Mormonism's place within the United States. He gets into everything from how these um, groups affect the local governments around them. And he also gets into, you know, how being a just desert religion might alter it as well. Throughout the book, especially beginning, at, I think every chapter pretty much, there's a quote taken out of a book that just studies religion. He uses a lot from the varieties of religious experiences. So you're getting an in-depth sociology as well. Now, something that I have to also praise him about in regards is the length of the book. And, you know, when you're doing these book reviews, people tend to fall into two categories, I've noticed. Those that say a book is a piece of art, therefore you shouldn't really consider the length of it. And then there's me who's like, oh, come on, you're much more likely if two friends recommend a book to you to read the shorter book than you are the longer book. I do think there's something to be said for being able to write a short piece of really good, engaging literature. Now, I've also read big books as well, but frankly, one of the litmus tests I have for an author is I'll read, if somebody recommends an author, I'll read that author's smallest work. And then after that, I know, hey, maybe then I will know his longer work. I can tolerate it. If I can't tolerate him for under 25 pages, though, I doubt I can tolerate him for 900 now, people who say you shouldn't think of length in the book, it's, it's very interesting because they seem to have no problem with authors going back, re-editing their work, and making it longer. So they'd say you should never say a book should be shorter, but at the same time it's okay to be longer. I don't get this. To me it's like saying you're fine with getting bigger knockers put on the Venus de Milo. It's just, you know, and I hate these authors who retouch their stuff because people rave about a book, but then you ask them which version of the book. And they won't really know which version of the book they've read, especially if it's like authors who are legendary for re-editing their works and then re-releasing them. And my father loved The Stand, but when asked which version of The Stand he read, he really didn't know. And a lot of people don't. Another really good thing I like about John Krakauer is in the book he does mention that, well, several of the Mormon beliefs are very interesting and seems sort of flaky to us there are belief structures outside of religion that many people adhere to and he only goes in depth about one he mentions a lot of the tenets of psychology you know such as the the freudian idea of the id ego super ego and all of that for as much as it's played in pop culture really not scientifically proven and i would add on to that You've got Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, which gives us some very interesting stuff to talk about, but it is a conceptual model none the least. I mean, think about it, though. What's your knee-jerk reaction to if I ask you, is there life in other parts of the universe? Well, whether you say yes or you say no, you're kind of basing that just on a belief. I mean, how many of us believed in Santa and everything like that? Of course, that is kind of religious in a way, but there's Sasquatch and everything like that. Um, you know, and at the time of that this is going on, of course, you've got a lot of liberal atheists who are anti-vaxxers. And, of course, you've got many good scientists, PhDs, who are religiously um, zealous. So yes, belief systems can happen outside of religion all the time. I mean, ask you know if you've used the phrase, I don't know, cheaters never prosper. Well, how do you actually really know that? This, there's no proof for that. It's a deep ingrained belief we all have, or it's reinforced in us. 
Of course, the last thing I'd point out is I have never met somebody who didn't have at least one superstition. It's within all of us. Now I'm going to get into the bad. Because of when this was published around 2003, you know, when he mentions the presidency and when he mentions the John Ashcroft, which I believe is, uh, I think it was Attorney General under Bush, president at this time, of course it all seems very much dated. Now, his commentary on Christianity. He makes it known that he is not a fan of the Christian church. In fact, he's probably from reading the last chapter in the book where he gets just into his remarks about it. He's an atheist. Well, well, it's debatable as to where Mormonism stands in relationship to Christianity. I think you could argue it is a Christian faith because it does believe in him, but that's up for grabs. His commentary in general on Christianity, yeah, it is fair to point out that Christianity has been tied to violence, just like pretty much every main religion out there. Though what's interesting is he points out specifically how Christianity is joined with the Republican Party, especially in the region where, you know, that Salt Lake City region, and it's tied to conservatism. Now, I would be denying all form of reality if I said that there is no connection between, in America, there's no connection between conservatism and Christianity. Of course there's a connection, especially many, many decades ago. Although you can have intense um, conservatives that are not Christian. George Will is a good example of this. You know, George Will is an arch conservative, but he's also an atheist. And likewise, you can have religious liberals or Democrats. Uh, I've often seen this technique done with a mention when they don't like Christianity, how it's bonded with a people will mention it's bonded with conservatism, yet they won't talk about the fact that several really prominent progressive liberals are also are also religious. Uh, Stephen Colbert is a good, for instance, of this one. Stephen Colbert is a raging Catholic who's tried to actually convert people on his show. He strongly identifies with liberal principles and is a Democrat. Also, you've got Michael Moore, who's in the same vein. Michael Moore has tried to make it his goal to be the spiritual advisor to Bill Maher, and it has not been working out for him, let's just say. However, 95% of his commentary on religion and, this ne and the negativity he feels towards it are confined to the last chapter, which is conveniently titled Auth Author's Remarks. So, and I think even the author will agree with me that that chapter, the last chapter, you can take it or leave it. It's sort of, it, it's sort of afterthought stuff. It doesn't touch on the main cases of violence. In conclusion, this is a very important book and it sheds light on stuff that really does happen. I mean, there is religious violence and I did some videos where I mentioned even, you know, growing up Seventh-day Adventist and the, some of the weird stuff that I remember from that still gives me some trouble. But I would say it's a great book. And I don't do this thing of if you only read one book this year. I would never do that because there's too much good literature out there. Um, but if you're going to read another book, please do read this book. And it's funny, I read this book because I wanted to, in October, I shift to reading spooky books. I couldn't get the spooky books that I actually wanted. Uh, that's a bit of a problem for me, you know, COVID and all that. So I read this on a lark, and it turned out to be far more terrifying than anything else. Yeah, October's a good month for book lovers. I want to give some shout-outs to people besides Hannah. SFF180, he did the 13 Days of Halloween, not going any longer, but you can check out those old things, those old clips. The Shades of Orange BookTube channel, a woman who's really into horror, yet at the same time, she's just like a super nice lady it's hard to imagine an epic reads youtube channel that's a division of harper collins uh thank you you all have a good one now